Hello, my name is Molly Sullivan. I'm the Director of Training and Certification at the Virginia Commonwealth University Work Incentive Planning and Assistance National Training and Data Center. At the WIPA NTDC, we're funded by Social Security to provide training and technical support for about 700 professionals across the country who provide work incentive planning services. I'm pleased to be here with you today to share information about what work incentive planning services are and how a person with a disability can access them. The overarching goal of this webcast is for you to know why you should refer someone for work incentive planning services and for you to know how to refer someone for this service. To achieve this goal, I'm going to provide you with information so that by the end of the webcast, you'll be able to do five key things. You'll be able to explain what work incentive planning services are. You'll be able to list the eligibility criteria for work incentive planning and assistance projects, which we call WIPA for short. You'll be able to locate a WIPA project based on a person's zip code. You'll be able to list strategies to find other professionals providing work incentive planning services in your state. And lastly, you'll be able to list ways you can build your own knowledge about work incentives. All right, to tackle our first objective, I'll begin by providing you some basic information about the work incentive planning service itself. A good place to start is looking at the purpose for this service. Why does this service even exist? Well, work incentive planning services exist to help people with disabilities who are receiving public benefits, who we refer to as beneficiaries, and who are either working or are interested in work. This service can help those beneficiaries make an informed financial decision about work. You see, all too often, Beneficiaries choose not to work or limit the amount that they work because of bad information about the effect of work on benefits. This service provides the person with accurate information about the effect work will have on each of their benefits. And with that accurate information, the people can make an informed decision about work. This service also helps beneficiaries use work incentives. Now, work incentives are benefit program rules that support working. For example, some work incentives make it possible for a beneficiary to keep Medicaid or Medicare when working. Other work incentives allow a beneficiary to keep some or all of their cash benefits when working. And others, allow a beneficiary to keep their case file open, even if the cash benefits stop due to work. The work incentive planning service not only helps a beneficiary see which work incentives could be useful in their situation, the service also involves supporting the person in requesting and getting work incentives approved. Now, another important aspect of this service is that it provides support to beneficiaries in developing strategies to manage public benefits. You've likely heard a beneficiary or their family member say to you, it's like a full-time job managing these benefits. And the reality is, it does take work to manage public benefits. Beneficiaries need to know when to report changes in their situation, who to report changes to, and how to make that report. And they need to know to do that for each type of benefit they receive, since reporting rules differ from one benefit to another. Ideally, each beneficiary has a record keeping system to keep benefit agency letters organized and to keep a record of their communication with those agencies. If beneficiaries don't stay on top of those reporting requirements, they could end up receiving benefits they aren't due, or lose benefits they should still be receiving. Work incentive planning services provide support for beneficiaries in developing strategies 
to manage their public benefits and prevent these issues. Lastly, the Work Incentive Planning Service includes help with problem solving some benefit issues. For example, if a beneficiary has received an overpayment letter due to work, a Work Incentive Counselor could help that person explore whether work incentives could be used to remove the overpayment in that situation. As you can see, this is a very important service for beneficiaries who are working or interested in working. So now that you understand the purpose of this service, let's take a look at what the service delivery process looks like. When a beneficiary is referred to Work Incentive Planning Services, in general, there are six core steps that the Work Incentive Counselor will take. First, the Work Incentive Counselor will determine whether the beneficiary is eligible for Work Incentive Planning Services. That eligibility criteria will be based on whoever is funding that service. We'll talk a bit more about this later in the webcast. In addition to determining eligibility, the Work Incentive Counselor will usually need to triage the person's situation. In other words, the counselor will evaluate how quickly the beneficiary needs services. If the beneficiary meets eligibility criteria, the second step is for the Work Incentive Counselor to conduct a comprehensive intake. Now, during the intake, the counselor will ask the beneficiary for information about their work goal, their benefit questions or concerns, demographic information, information about their income, information about health insurance, and their past work activity. The Work Incentive Counselor will also ask the beneficiary to sign releases of information so that they can contact benefit agencies to verify which benefits the person has. They may also request signed releases of information to be able to communicate with members of the beneficiary's employment team as needed. After the intake, the Work Incentive Counselor will contact benefit agencies and verify the person's benefits. In some parts of the country, this can take two to four weeks, um, and in other parts of the country, it can happen quicker. So there's some variation. Once the Work Incentive Counselor has verified all of the public benefits, the fourth step is to analyze the effect of the work goal on each public benefit and write up a summary of that analysis in a report that we call a Benefits Summary and Analysis, or BSA for short. The Work Incentive Counselor may need to do a little bit of research around some of the public benefit rules or reach out to their technical assistance to complete this step, depending on the beneficiary's situation. Now the fifth step is for the Work Incentive Counselor to provide the advisement. This is the meat of the service. In this step, the, the counselor explains what they estimate will happen to each benefit given the beneficiary's work goal. They also address what work incentives that they recommend the beneficiary use and how the beneficiary can financially get ahead by working. The Work Incentive Counselor will use the BSA as a guide during this conversation and the beneficiary has the BSNA to then refer back to as needed. The person's employment team members are absolutely encouraged to join this meeting, but if they aren't available, the Work Incentive Counselor can share a copy of that BSA with them as long as the beneficiary has approved that type of information sharing. The sixth and final step uh, is also really the meat of this service. Um, work incentive planning includes providing ongoing support, assuming, of course, that the work incentive counselor's funding has allowed for that. Um, and we'll talk more about that, um, that aspect a little bit later in the webcast. 
If ongoing support is something that the Work Incentive Counselor is funded to do, this is an absolutely invaluable aspect of the service. The Work Incentive Counselor can help a beneficiary use work incentives, develop strategies to manage public benefits, and problem solve some benefit issues that arise. Depending upon the funder, this support could be available for a limited time or indefinitely. All right, now you know what the purpose of this service is and the steps that are generally taken to deliver it. Let's take a look at the professionals who make this service possible. The people who deliver work incentive planning and services are generally professionals in disability services and they're professionals who have acquired specialized knowledge and skills to provide advisement about the effect of work on public benefits. The job title that a professional uses will vary depending upon the funding agency and also whether that professional has obtained a certification or not. Now, I'll share with you the more common job titles you'll hear so you can become familiar with who you might be teaming up with in the future. The first job title listed here is a Community Work Incentive Coordinator, or CWIC for short. A CWIC is a professional who's funded through the Social Security Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program. With this funding, CWICs provide beneficiaries, free of charge, advisement about the effect of work on public benefits. Now, Social Security requires CWICs to participate in an intensive training and pass a rigorous initial certification process prior to working with beneficiaries. And additionally, CWICs are required to complete continuing certification activities to maintain their certification. The program that I work for, the VCU National Training and Data Center, is funded by Social Security to provide that training and certification to CWICs. Now, a number of years ago, Social Security opened up that rigorous training and certification to professionals who are not funded by the WIPA program, but who have other funding that they can use to provide work incentive counseling. These professionals who complete this same initial training and initial certification process as CWICs are called Community Partner Work Incentive Counselors. These community partners must also complete continuing certification activities to maintain their certification. It's just that their requirements are slightly different from CWICs. Now the third job title listed is one that's also based upon obtaining a certification. The Benefits and Work Incentives Practitioner is a title that's given to a professional that completes the Cornell University training and certification requirements. And like the CWICs and Community Partner Work Incentive Counselors, Cornell also requires these professionals complete continuing education to maintain their certification. Now the last bullet on this slide lists a handful of other job titles you may hear, including Work Incentive Counselor, Benefits Planner, and Benefits Specialist. These job titles are not associated with a national certification like the first three. It's possible a professional who uses one of these job titles has completed some type of training or even one of the certifications noted above, but you would need to ask them to clarify their credentials. Throughout this webcast, I'm using the generic term work incentive counselor to refer to any professional providing this service. All right, now you know what the purpose of this service is, you know who delivers this service, and you also know what steps are generally taken when a professional is providing this service to a beneficiary. So let's take a look at how you can achieve the first objective of this webcast. As a reminder, 
the first objective is for you to be able to explain work incentive planning services. To do that, you'll want to combine the three topics you just learned about. What the service is, who delivers it, and how they deliver the service. On this slide, you'll see some key points to say for each of those topics. In regard to what the service is, you'd want to share with a person that work incentive planning services can help them make an informed decision about work, can help them use work incentives, develop strategies to manage benefits, and problem solve some benefit issues that arise. Then, let the person know the service is provided by trained and certified professionals, assuming, of course, that you're referring the person to a professional that has completed training and certification. Lastly, let the person know that the work incentive counselor will conduct a thorough intake, verify their public benefits, estimate the effect, the effect of work on those benefits, and provide ongoing support about benefits and work. As with anything new, at first, this might seem like a lot to remember, but with practice, you'll see it becomes easy to remember these three concepts and explain this service. Now, <clears throat> the availability of this service <clears throat> varies a bit from state to state because the amount of funding for this service varies from state to state. The good news is that there is at least one organization in every state that's funded to provide this service through the Social Security WIPA program. In um, just a little bit, we'll talk about some of the other programs that may be funded to provide this service in your state. But first, let's look at some of the details about WIPA since we know for sure that exists in every state. So through a competitive application process, Social Security awards WIPA funding to at least one entity for each state. Um, and it's awarded to uh, entities such as nonprofit organizations or a state agency or a county agency. In states with larger populations, there will be more than one WIPA project. For example, in Texas, there are five WIPA projects, whereas in Wyoming, there's only one WIPA project. If a state has more than one WIPA project, each project will have a designated part of the state to serve. Generally, the service areas are divided up by counties. So for example, if there are two WIPA projects in your state, often each will cover half of the counties so that together the entire state has access to the service. Um, another important point about this service is that a beneficiary can access this service free of charge. There is no cost because Social Security is funding this service. So who can use this service? Well, to be eligible for services through a WIPA project, a person must be at least 14 years of age and under full retirement age. There are a few situations in which a person could be over full retirement age and receive services, but those are details that you would need to talk through with the WIPA project on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, now, a person must also have been determined disabled based on Social Security's definition. And lastly, a person must be receiving um, either supplemental security income, also called SSI, or be receiving a social security disability benefit, uh, the most common of which is called social security disability insurance, or SSDI for short. Um, if a person is not receiving one of those benefits due to work, it's possible they may still be eligible for services. Um, now, there are many beneficiaries in the country who meet this WIPA eligibility criteria. Since Social Security's goal is to promote employment, they require the WIPA projects to focus their time and energy on serving a few key populations. The first is people who are working. 
The second is people who aren't working but who are actively seeking work. And the third is youth ages 14 to 25. All three of these groups include people who need work incentive planning services immediately given their proximity to having earned income. Now, it's possible for a WIPA project to serve someone who meets the eligibility criteria but doesn't fall into one of these three groups. Um, but you'll need to talk with your WIPA projects to learn more about their capacity to serve those other groups. So now you know the WIPA eligibility criteria as well as the groups that they have a heavy emphasis on serving. That means we've tackled the second objective. With those details under your belt, we'll talk about how you can find the WIPA projects in your state. I'm happy to report there is an online directory that you can use to locate the WIPA project that serves a particular zip code. The directory is located at www.choosework.ssa.gov. Now, once you navigate to that web address, you'll need to click the term Find Help. Then, Click on the phrase, start your direct search, which you'll find under um, the, the term option two, direct search. Once you've done that, check the box next to the term benefits counseling WIPA and uncheck the other types of service providers, assuming that you're just trying to search for a WIPA provider. Then, Enter the person's zip code. Keep the default filters, I would suggest, um, in the search box to show that they, um, the services that are available both virtually and in person. And then simply click Start New Search. What will happen is the names of the agencies that provide WIPA services for that zip code um, that you entered will appear along with their contact information. Now, if you run into any trouble using the search feature for this online directory, you can contact the Ticket to Work helpline at 1-866-968-7842. That phone number is listed on the Choose Work website. So, you can see how locating a WIPA project is easy. You simply need to know the person's zip code. Then, once you locate the WIPA project information, you can share those details with the person you're supporting, and they can contact the project and request services. Now, if you're thinking you're going to be referring a large number of people to the WIPA project, um, you can also reach out to the project yourself and ask if they would like you to follow any special processes for making a referral. By coordinating, you may be able to save everyone some very precious time. All right, now that you know how to locate a WIPA project, let's talk about other work incentive planning services that may be available in your state. As I mentioned earlier, one of the great aspects of WIPA is that it's available in every state. But the downside is that the funding is limited. Uh, in most states, the WIPA funding isn't enough to assist everyone who needs services. So in response to this capacity issue, some states have found other ways to fund work incentive planning services. The availability of other funding for this service varies widely from state to state, but I, I can at least share with you some information about the more common efforts happening across the country. Now, in a number of states, the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency has either dedicated specific staff to provide this service, or they're paying for this service using a fee-for-service model, or contracting some of the funds to an agency, and that um, agency that has the contract has a dedicated work incentive counselor on staff providing services. What that means is that if you're supporting someone who's receiving VR services, it's possible 
they may be able to get work incentive planning services through the VR agency. In some states, the Medicaid agency has included benefits advisement as a distinct Medicaid service in a home and community-based waiver, or the Medicaid agency considers benefits advisement to be an aspect of Medicaid-funded supported employment services. At this time, the Medicaid-funded options don't seem to be as common um, nationally as the VR-funded options, but they do seem to be growing. So um, a beneficiary would need to talk with their Medicaid case manager um, or their Medicaid-funded employment provider to find out if work incentive planning services are part of the Medicaid service package that they have. Lastly, there are some organizations that have just taken the initiative to use their general agency funding to have one or more work incentive counselors on staff providing services to the people that their agency serves. This is something that you may find in, um, in an employment network or a supported employment program or even a center for independent living, for example. In this type of situation, a beneficiary would be able to access work incentive planning services if they were a client receiving services from that organization that had built that internal capacity. So now that you have an idea of some other ways a person may access this service, let's take a look at strategies you can use to find out what's happening in your state. Since each state is so unique in regard to what capacity has been built, you'll need to do a bit of networking to find out who all is providing work incentive planning services. If you're supporting someone who's enrolled in VR, begin by asking the person's VR counselor if there are any work incentive counselors on staff at the VR agency who provide this service, or if there are any vendors that the VR agency contracts with to provide this needed service. Um, if you're working with um, someone who has a Medicaid-funded supported employment service, you could ask the Medicaid case manager if work incentive planning is a part of the Medicaid service package, um, and if so, who is providing that type of service. You could also ask the person's supported employment provider if they've built any internal capacity to provide this service. So it really comes down to taking a look at who the person's receiving services from to see if any of those entities have built that capacity. Now this is not an exhaustive list. Um, instead, I encourage you to use this as a starting point and continue to ask your colleagues, what do they know about who's providing service, service in this, this service in your state? Um, networking will be a, a huge resource for better understanding what's available. All right, let's take a look at our final objective. While referring someone to a work incentive counselor, it's helpful in many situations and an equally important step in addressing this need for you to be able to provide accurate and encouraging information about benefits and work. The people you support have developed a bond of trust with you, which means that you, what you say carries a lot of weight as they make important decisions about work. Given that, it's so important for you to build your basic knowledge about work incentives. And you can do that a couple of ways. You could take a web course that's provided and approved by Social Security, which we offer through the VCU National Training and Data Center. It's called Introduction to Social Security Disability Benefits work incentives, and employment support programs. This is a two-week web course, and it consists of six separate one-hour lessons. Each lesson includes a recorded video lecture with slides, some supplemental readings, uh, as well as resources and tools, some interactive activities and knowledge checks. Now, this is a largely self-directed and self-paced course, and it's also absolutely free. 
Um, you can find out more information about this course by clicking on the first link provided on this slide. Another great way to build your basic knowledge about work incentives is by reading through Social Security's publication called The Red Book. This publication provides clear and simple explanations of the basic work rules for Social Security disability insurance and for supplemental security income. A link to the Red Book can be found at the end of this slide. And with that, you now know why and how to refer someone for work incentive planning services. You know how to explain this service you know the eligibility criteria for WIPA projects, and you know how to locate a WIPA project based on a person's zip code. You know some strategies for locating other professionals in your state who might be providing work incentive planning services, and you know ways that you can build your own knowledge about work incentives. All right, now that you've gained all this great knowledge, We'd love to address any questions that came up for you during this webcast.